Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. If you remember in the last video, we talked about how not to sin. And of course, the simple uh, answer to that is we believe. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin, dearly beloved. If you don't know that you've been made the righteousness of God in Christ, it's important to understand that we are saints and we're called saints. That we've been justified freely by His grace. We're dealing with the person and the work of Christ uh, in our verse-by-verse -verse study. We've reached 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. He's the propitiation of our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. Not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Now, I freely admit that translators often insert words so that it's clear to you. You know, you don't, you don't have enough sense, I guess, to understand it. So we have to insert words in there to make it clear. Uh, the NIV does this, the, the RSV does this, the King James does this. The problem is you should be very careful when you insert words that are unique, uh, for there's no verse of scripture that speaks of the sins of the world, none. The word does occur in the singular, but never in the plural, and yet all of these modern translations have substituted it in the plural. The, the King James, at least, uh, uh, italicizes it so that you know, you know ahead of time that this isn't there. We've stuck it in. I don't believe it, uh, it is biblical to speak of the sins of the world. The problem is that this verse is used by a great number of people uh, to, uh, I believe, literally just destroy the biblical concept of the finished work of Christ. He died for everybody. You, know, you can't go any place around the world where the majority of Christians say Christ died for everybody. God loves everybody. And they come up with verses like this. So many people say that, that God is, is sovereign. Of course He's sovereign, but God could sovereignly will that He's going to... Uh, He's, he's just going to back off from your life, okay? He's going to present uh, Jesus Christ uh, uh, sacrificed. And then, so then it's up to you. It's up to you to either accept that uh, and go to heaven or reject that and go to hell. You know, you know, couldn't God, the argument is, couldn't God do that sovereignly? Well, my first answer has to be absolutely not because God can't do anything He didn't do. Now, I know that's deep, but think about it for a moment. Folks, there's no decisions with God. You know, I mean, you have to decide, is this better than that? Is, is this more right than that? That's what we would do. You know, would this have, have better results than that? God never had that problem. Never once did that situation ever present itself to God. Never was there a why or, or a, a fork in the road. That's not the God of Scriptures. You know, whatever He willed, that He did, and and... And that's good. But suppose, suppose that he did that, and that's what most Christians think it is. The gospel today, as you know, is that Christ has done all he can. The rest is up to you. That's, that's typical of the evangelical gospel. It, it's preached around the world every day. Uh, if that were true, then most of the Bible would be, uh, would be error. Okay, the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, and he cannot know them. The natural man cannot obey God. The natural man can't please God. He's not subject to the law of God. He has no ability to do that, and you go on and on and on with verses of, of Scripture where that if you took the modern evangelistic approach today, everybody would go to hell. Uh, if God sovereignly left the choice up to you, everybody would go to hell. Unless you throw all that scripture out. He died in our place. He died in your stead. He died in your place. We know that his death was substitutionary. The word clearly says that it was. And yet here's a verse that says that he died for the sins of the whole world. The whole world. There you see, okay? There you see Jesus Christ died for everybody's sins. So it's up to you. You know, you got to make the choice. And in doing that, 
you virtually destroy most of the Word of God. You exalt man. You blaspheme Christ. That's what you do. To ever suggest that the choice was, was man's is to blaspheme the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it doesn't say the sins of the world, plural, okay? He's the singular propitiation for our sins. God is propitiated. Do you know that God cannot be angry with you? God cannot be displeased with you as far as sins are concerned. If He can be, then He's not propitiated. In light of the finished work of Christ, uh, we need to understand redemption, reconciliation, and propitiation. Propitiation is the Godward aspect of the finished work of Christ. God is propitiated. He's never angry with you. He never deals with you in anger and wrath. He's, he's never displeased with you. Uh, in His sight, you're holy, unblameable, and unreprovable. And to depart from that truth is to build up uh, man and push down Christ. And I just will not do that. This book is not a revelation of man and what ma man ought to do. This book, this book is a revelation of Jesus Christ and what He's done for you. Somebody says, I'm going to tell you what great things that God has done for me. You know, I got hooked on alcohol and, and it got so bad. My wife and family, they, they, my wife threw me out of the house and, you know, we got a divorce and I'm walking the streets and I'm living behind a dumpster and, you know, you know it goes on. You know how the story goes. And I stumbled into a mission and praise God for the first time I heard the message of the gospel. And I'm, I'm now vice president of the Oklahoma Cattlemen's Association. And if God did that for me, he can do it for you. Well, that's, that's, that's wonderful. Is, is that what great things Christ has done for you? Let me tell you what Christ has done for me. He redeemed me. He loved me. When I hated Him, He died in my place, though I'm a sinner and I deserve hell because I'm one of His own. He loves me. My sins are never brought to mind. I stand before Him holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight. That is my personal testimony. Our testimony is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now we are looking at propitiation for the whole world. The Lord Jesus Christ in the 13th chapter of Matthew said the field is the world. Christ says the field is the world. That's what He said. And in that world are the sons of the kingdom and the sons of the devil. And He loved that world, but He gave Himself for the sons of the kingdom. There's no way Jesus Christ died in the place of the sons of the devil. And Christianity doesn't want to talk about sons of the devil. They don't even want to talk about that. Christ had no problem talking about it. Ye are of your father the devil, and most ministers don't want to even talk about that. Can't be sons of the devil and, and sons of God because man's got to have some kind of a choice. I mean, you know, he, well, he does. He chose against God. That's, that was his choice. He receives not the things of the Spirit of God. He has no ability to do that. He can't please God. He's not subject to the law of God. He can't hear the Word of God. He can't cease from sinning. If Jesus Christ died in your place, you cannot die. So if Jesus Christ died in every man's place, hell is a foolish subject. Nobody can, nobody can go to hell. There are no sons of the devil, but Jesus Christ did not die in everybody's place. So we have propitiation to deal with here. Now, there's a few concepts that we could talk about. You know, uh, this verse is an exaggeration. That's what some have said. It's a figure of speech. You know, it could mean that he died for those in, in the past who were sons of the kingdom as well as those in the future who are the sons of the kingdom. It, it could be that, that, that what he means is, well, it, it's a propitiation for both Jew and Gentile. I'm giving you these because these all occur in Christian literature. One thing that occurs in Christian literature uh, is He died for everybody, that Christ loves everybody, and we know at least, well, we know at least He didn't love Esau. Uh, it's not quite the, po the most popular verse. We know He's angry with the wicked. I had someone uh, uh, once in a Bible study uh, class, they, they said, well, there, there's a hundred verses in the Gospel of John alone that says God loves everybody, and uh, I said, well, just show me one verse. 
you know, I don't need a hundred, just give me one. And, and well, they paged through, you know, the Bible for about 20 minutes. They got up and walked out. I never saw the person again. Folks, there are not a hundred verses in the Gospel of John that says God loves everybody. That is simply not true. Those who received Him only received Him because they were born by His will. They didn't receive Him because of anything in themselves at all. They were born by His will. You cannot produce a verse, a single verse of Scripture that would lead you to believe that Jesus Christ was a propitiation for everyone. And then there was Calvin, of course. Calvin said he, well, what Calvin said was he died sufficiently for all and he died effectively for the elect. Now, what Calvin meant by that is, is, is not what I think the scriptures teach. Had God left it up to man, everybody would go to hell. You can't produce any scripture that says that the natural man has the ability to come to Christ. The church, folks, is starving. It's, it's not only starving, it's being poisoned by man being supreme and Christ being pushed down. Unless a man be born of water and wind, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And I'm going to suggest to you that that's two births. Okay, You don't have to argue with that. You don't have to agree with that. I'm just telling you what I think. I'm simply going to try to present what I think this text is saying. When it says Christ is a propitiation for the whole world, he does not say he's a propitiation for the sins of the whole world. That's not there. It's not in any Greek text. And to think that any translator would substitute it when it's contrary to Scripture is hard for me to, to wrap my mind around. And yet it's in all of your translations. Well, uh, it, it might not, it, it wouldn't be in Young's literal, but it is in most of the others. And I'm going to suggest that that's, that's two births, okay? He said water and wind. Everybody knows wind means spirit. So the translators say, you don't know what he meant by wind, so we're going to have to make that spirit. So, you know, because you're kind of too stupid to understand what he's talking about. And so we'll, we'll make it... Uh, uh, spirit. Why didn't the translator say you don't know what he meant by water? I mean, we'll make it word. I, I, I don't know why they didn't do that, but it seems to me that if wind is symbolic, then water ought to be symbolic in the same context. Now, Christ goes on and says that the wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound thereof and can't tell where it came from or where it's going, and they translated it wind. I, I think that's also true of the Spirit. The Spirit moves where He wills. John 1.29, the next day John sees Jesus uh, coming, saying, here's the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. Now, here it's singular. In 1 John, the substitution uh, is plural. Uh, this is singular. So it's, it's one sin that He takes away. It's not dying in everybody's place. It isn't a propitiation for the sins, plural, of everyone in the world system. We know the world's a field. Christ said that. But you cannot take the word uh, cosmos, world, and say that every place that occurs, you, you can just, well, you can write field in there. Okay, you can't do that. The world is an organized system. The organized system Christ was talking about, uh, he calls the field. But in that field are sons of God and sons of the devil. John 1. 1 9. That's the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 1, verse 9. That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Uh, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, which lighteth every man that, that cometh into the world. Now, now here's a verse that, that tied in with our present uh, verse here in 1 John. You know, see, He enlightens everybody that comes into the world. And, and what that means is, well, you know, there's that little candle. Okay, if you just preach the gospel right, you can, you know, fan that little flame. It'll burst into a big flame. You know, if you just preach the gospel right and, and you fan that flame, It'll burst into a big flame. That's, that's where they get that from this verse. 
that every man has within him a little bit of light. But that is not what Scripture declares. Scripture boldly declares that man is born totally depraved. And I'm going to suggest to you folks that, that that verse is tied in with these two births. We could argue that every man that, that comes into the world is going to hell because Adam died, you know, because Adam sinned. You could, you could sure, surely you could argue that, that for by one man sin entered the world, that's, that's that world system, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all sinned, singular, okay? That's the one I think was removed in Jesus Christ. That's why every man is lighted, uh, uh, because he is not under Adam's condemnation. But modern evangelism says there's that little flame there. Every man has enough ability, just to, just enough, you know, to know a little bit of truth. And and if you just fan it just right, he'll accept Christ, which is absolutely contrary to a whole body of Scripture. The natural man knows not the things of God. In fact, they are foolishness to him. He cannot know them. Christ said, you cannot hear my words. And we can go on and on with the total depravity passages of Scripture. If you don't believe man is totally depraved, uh, you don't take God at his word. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered the world and death by sin, all man's sin, singular. Romans 5.18, therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came, came upon all men. Well, what was that judgment? Adam's sin. They are under that judgment. Romans 5.18, therefore, as by the offense of one, a judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. So the free gift came upon all men unto justification of light. That, that's the light that lights every man that comes into the world. Romans 5, 19, For by one man's disobedience the elect were made sinners. They are made sinners because of Adam's disobedience. In the same way the elect are made righteous by the obedience of Christ. Romans 7, 9, I was alive apart from the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Well, how was he alive apart from the commandment? If, if you go to theological seminary today, Paul accepted Christ. He realized he was a new creation in Christ. Uh, he went to Damascus. He saw a belly dancer, he, and sin revived, and he died. And surely you, you, don't, you folks don't believe that. Uh, if you do, you have my deepest sympathy. In fact, I never thought belly dancing was all that attractive myself, but anyway, that aside, I was alive apart from the law once. Well, how was he alive? Because Adam's judgment had been removed. So death entered the world and death by sin. Now, bear in mind that before death, there had to be life. I mean, nothing dies unless it's first alive. I've been trying to explain that for the longest time. Uh, so you were alive in Adam before you died in Adam. Now something happened that Paul was made alive again. He's had one death in Adam, now he's made alive. He has a second death in Christ. He now has to be, what, born again. Why do you have to be born again if you were born once? Well, a lot of evangelists can, well, they, they just kind of get by handling that the easy way. What they say is you're born once physically, you're born once spiritually, and that just destroys a whole body of truth. Christ said to Nicodemus, you have to be born of water and wind. So they say that, well, that's the water of the physical birth and wind is the spiritual birth. Just doesn't fit in the, in the, in the context here. The water is used of the word. Any man that drinks of the water that I give him, she'll never thirst again. Uh, surely that's not the water of the physical birth. It just doesn't make sense. I was alive apart from the law once, then the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And now Paul needs to be born again. So we have a death in Adam. We have a death in personal sin. And we have two births, just like Christ told a rabbi who should have known better. 1 Timothy 4, 10. This gets better here, okay? For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. Well, how did he deliver all men? Dearly beloved, he delivered them from Adam's condemnation, Adam's judgment. He didn't deliver them from their own sin. 1 Peter 1, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy has begotten us again 
unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Well, when were we begotten unto a living uh, hope before that? If it wasn't the removal of Adam's transgression. 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2. 1 Peter 2. Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. And, and there isn't a theologian in the world who's Arminian who doesn't wish that that word returned wasn't there. You sinned in Adam. Christ died in your place. You were made alive in Christ. Then you died in your own sins. And now you need to be born again. You are returned. Second Peter 2. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privately shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, get that, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. He bought them, folks, because he removed Adam's judgment. Jude chapter 1, verse 12, These are spots in your feasts of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth without fruit, twice dead, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. And twice dead, folks, doesn't mean really dead. It doesn't mean, well, you got some people over here that are dead and some people over here, they're really dead. And that's what, you know, twice dead means. And I've actually had people tell me that. Plucked up by the roots, twice dead. The Holy Spirit's not trying to emphasize the fact that these people are really, really dead or, or that, or that you know, though they're feasting with you, they're physically dead because uh, they're actually there, physically alive. But they are twice dead spiritually. They died in Adam. That judgment was removed. They died in their own sins. In Revelation 20, death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And a great number of people... Uh, say, well, the first one was physical death, and this is spiritual death. Absolutely not. It is a spiritual death because Christ did not die in their place as their substitute. That's the second death of Revelation 20. It's my constant prayer, folks. Dearly beloved, it's my constant prayer that you will come to understand the truth concerning who you are in Christ and all He's done for you, that you will grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.